he declined uh, to take a piece of Stonewall Jackson's monument with him. But who knows however many others had come and taken back a piece of Jackson's monument. But here we see it as being part of the May 1884 reunion. So this is done uh, by the Society of the First Army Corps, organized by historian James H. Stein, and Amy might have heard him reading there, who's working on writing a book. Uh, he's touring the battlefields for three days, led by prominent veterans um, who are engaged there. And they go to Chancellorsville on May 6th, or 16th, excuse me, that's when they're taking this photo. They have their tour of the Jackson Wounding Area, led by James Power Smith, who writes one of the definitive accounts of Jackson's wounding. Um, you can tell that my voice is just going to drip with jealousy the more that I describe this reunion. Uh, Joseph Dickinson, Union Staff Officer, describes the layout of federal lines at Chancellorsville. Henry Slocum is detailing the layout of the 12th Corps on the battlefield. It's just the most unimaginable tour ever, um, one of the greatest. But it's also interesting to note that this is the first reunion of the Society of the Army of the First Corps south of the Potomac. So this is a great experiment. Can we all get along if we go south of the Potomac? And I think their answer is resoundingly yes. Um, uh, news, another newspaper author writing about the reunion said the convention of the Union and late Confederate soldiers, which has just finished on the scene of that bloody field, was a success in every sense. And good fellowship and manly feeling exhibited by former foes but present friends is a beautiful tribute to the thoroughness of American manhood. So you see uh, mixed in here a little bit of the stacky language of reunion, right? Because I'm sure that there were plenty of veterans on both sides who were thinking, you know, really, I'm not okay with this person. But you see that the prevailing notion is actually we are going to get along. We are former foes but now present friends. And there is this, as the newspapers even term it, a love feast. Their words, not mine. Um, but you see also a little bit of civility here. This is a mixture of Union and Confederate veterans. Are you going to come down from the north and rain fire and brimstone on the Confederates in their presence? If you're a Confederate soldier and you've just welcomed these Union soldiers into your area, are you going to be rude? Of course not. These are people. They're going to be polite to each other. They're going to get along because it's important to them that they do. And I think it's very important to the future of this country that they do. And so they do get along. It also helps Stein to write his book, of course, which was one of his main motivations for doing so. But I think it's important to note how they're able to come back together. And a lot of these men are going to focus on the details of the fighting, the things that they can agree upon, which is that both sides fought with honor, both sides fought with valor. Both sides did excellent, amazing military maneuvers, didn't they? And so there's a lot that they can find to respect in each other. And it's going to be in those sort of details that they're able to rebuild those sort of um, blocks of fellowship. Um, those blocks, in some ways, become literal in a lot of the monuments that are going to dot the battlefield. You see that the stone for Jackson at some point becomes inadequate, partly because people are chipping away at it, but also because there had just been a monument placed to John Sedgwick down at Spotsylvania, and while that monument was being dedicated, there was someone in the audience, some persistent fellow, who kept saying, but we've forgotten Jackson. In remembering Sedgwick, we've forgotten Jackson. And so in answer to that persistent fellow who kept saying, what about Jackson? Why are we honoring Sedgwick? Um, they go to work for a more formal monument for Stonewall Jackson at Chancellorsville. So this photo is June of 1888. If you take a good look at the joints here, you'll notice the mortar is still wet, it's still dark. So this monument has truly just been placed, just been completed. Um, you see the space in Chancellor, in Chancellorsville, uh, Chancellor of Chancellorsville, one of them, um, is here on the left. He is also a veteran. He served with the 9th Virginia Cavalry. Um, and you see in this monument, one of the things that I really appreciate about it is that this is truly a Confederate veteran monument. So it's not just a monument to Jackson. This is something that has been put together across the South. So you see um, Rufus B. Merchant, member of Cobb's Legion, James Power Smith, they partnered to form the Chancellorsville Stonewall Jackson Monument Association. But more than that, the design drawings for this monument come from Colonel Wilfred E. Cutshaw, Richmond City engineer and former Confederate artillerist or artillery and staff officer with Jackson. The granite is donated from Lieutenant Colonel Richard Snowden Andrews, who commanded artillery under Jackson, and Fredericksburg's Hope Foundry actually forged the iron fence to go around it. So this isn't just a monument to Jackson. In a lot of ways, this is something that is contributed from people across the South, from veterans 
um, who are here to honor Jackson and his service. Uh, the cornerstone, when it's laid by James Power Smith, he says, I lay this cornerstone to the memory of one of the best and purest men that I have known, one of my best and dearest friends. So you see both a personal tribute as well as tribute in stone to Jackson. The formal dedication to this monument, you can imagine, is going to gather a lot of Confederate veterans together in one place. So you notice that I've been talking a lot about Union veterans. Union veterans, a lot of times, had more wherewithal to travel um, and had a lot farther to go. So it was more of a to-do when they visited these battlefields in Virginia. But you can imagine that a dedication to the monument to Stonewall Jackson's wounded was going to attract a lot of attention here in the South. And it did. They expected three to 500 to attend, including dignitaries like Governor Fitz Lee, uh, Charles Collis, um, Raleigh Colston, and Jed Hotchkiss. And in reality, 5,000 turned up. So I have no idea where they put it. <laughs> but they formed up a line of carriages at Chancellorsville at noon to, for everyone to be escorted together to the monument. There was music, the introduction of Governor Lee, a prayer by James Power Smith, an ode, oration by Senator John W. Daniel, the former Jewel Early staffer, a salute by the Fredericksburg Grays, another ode, uh, then an introduction of Jackson's staff and distinguished guests. Now, I think some of the most interesting things come about as they're actually dedicated the monument. So during the governor's address, it's Lee's address, several times, as the newspaper reported, several times Governor Lee commenced his sentences by saying impressively, ah, well I remember that day. And some old veteran in the crowd shouted out, so do I, General. So there's a little bit of, of uh, familiarity among these veterans and their common experience. Um, but you see again, this is a place of memory and reminiscence, as well as one of honor and collective participation, uh, at least for one man in the audience. Now it's interesting again to see what these men write, and what they say about the dedication of Jackson's monument. Uh, James Power Smith's prayer said, When our children and theirs shall look upon this memorial we have heaped together, and shall ask, What mean ye by these stones? Let it not be that any bitterness or hatred shall be stirred in any heart, but only a grateful memory of the good and great who here fell in the storm of battle. So we've talked a lot about you, and here we see a little bit more of it saying, look, let's put all of that aside. What is important for us to remember here is the greatness of General Jackson. That's what we should be focusing on, General Jackson and his men. Senator Daniel follows in that same theme. As he closes, he wrote, were the American continent sunk tomorrow beneath the ocean, and if only a copy of the Declaration of Independence were rescued from the destroying wave, coming generations of other lands would know that it had been the home of a fearless people that have loved liberty and of a great people who knew how to defend it. So that's for America. But he says, the Confederate States of America have sunk out of sight forever beneath the waves of war. But had their people no other tokens by which to tell their tale, they could rest their honor safely to posterity, lifting upon their hands the tablets whereupon are written the traits of Robert E. Lee and Thomas Jonathan Jackson. It's a really interesting statement, isn't it? This is somebody saying that the very embodiment of the Confederate States of America is safe if we can only rely upon the traits of these two men. It tells you a lot about the roles of these prominent individuals in the eyes of Confederate veterans, and it tells you the importance of a monument like this to say, this is our heritage and this is what's important. And this is what we want to tell. This is what we want to pass down. It tells you a lot about the heroes and a lot about the virtues that these veterans wanted to promote. Interestingly though, as with a lot of such events, you have kind of a balance of this very solemn situation and then a little bit of humor tossed in. So the, the whole scene with 5,000 people described as a large picnic, um, complete with a minstrel singer. A newspaper report sidebar included I would say two very interesting, but totally unrelated uh, things, which I'll share. Uh, one said, we agree with the young lady at the Jackson Monument who said the style of sparking has materially changed since I was in the business. It was new fashion to us, too. I can't imagine what was happening, but we passed that along. The other said, John Barleycorn knocked down a number of indiscreet visitors at Chancellorsville. They lay about the woods like dead soldiers. <laughs> Might also be the cause of that one fellow in the back saying, so do I, General. Um, but in any case, uh, you do definitely see a large gathering of veterans coming forward to, to honor um, the legacy of Stonewall Jackson here at Chancellorsville. 
there at Chancellor's Hill. But you have, later on, um, another gathering, this time of Union Veterans, and I think, well, actually, a mixed group, predominantly Union Veterans coming down um, to visit the battlefields. But, this, again, the statements that they make, this time it's 1900, so even more time has passed. So we're making even more progress toward bringing for the nation being um, really one. Some several decades later, and this is in this photo you might find interesting. Uh, Dan Sickles, the most prominent person here. You'll see him standing second from right, a single leg. Uh, but also here you have Comte de Hansonville, Stanton Sickles, Comte de Paris, and Colonel Coppinger. Again, if those names uh, mean things to you. We're going to focus more on what they talked about, though. Uh, notable attendees of this annual reunion of the Society of the Army of the Potomac in Fredericksburg. Um, notable attendees included President McKinley, the Secretary of War, Root, uh, General Nelson A. Miles, Governor Tyler from Virginia, and General Martin T. McMahon. They had speeches, tours, meetings. Um, all of their speeches actually fill a very large book, so I always take comfort in that whenever I get a speech that at least mine didn't go on for <coughs> the entire book length. Um, but the general trend of these speeches is going to be extremely reconciliatory, so again, continuing that theme that we've been talking about. You have speakers from both sides here. So this is a really interesting moment in which you have predominantly a union reunion coming through, but you have speakers, prominent speakers from both sides. And they're going to be talking about some common themes. They're lauding men on both sides for their courage, their fortitude, their sacrifice. You have one man, John T. Gord, just a Confederate private, who said, on these fields, Americanism in its highest and holiest sense was illustrated and illuminated. Here, a colossal column of men marched to death testifying thereby the highest expression of patriotism, love of country. To some degree, though, you also see this reunion happening primarily on unique terms, because this is the Society of the Army of the Potomac. So you see Dan Sickles kind of stirring the pot as usual, um, and he said, Today the South and North know each other better than ever before. On many battlefields we learn to respect the courage, patriotism, devotion, and tenacity of which each side gave so many splendid examples. We have all been taught the inestimable value of our union. It stands a little bit in contrast to what we just heard. At the same time, trying to fit it into the idea of reconciliation. So you see that truly this falls on a spectrum. There are some people who are perfectly willing to say bygones are bygones. There's some people who are saying, well, bygones are bygones. If it's kind of on our terms. And then you have some people saying, never. And that's on both sides, Union and Confederate. But a lot of them are going to be focusing again on some familiar themes. They're recounting the loss of life compared to other wars and campaigns. You see them trying to make sense of it. You see that in Confederate General Joseph Wheeler's remarks. He wrote, death is at all times surrounded by sadness and sorrow. And this is especially true when the victims are the youthful, buoyant spirits, who are always first to obey their country's call to arms. But the bravery of such men on the field where their lives are sacrificed is the most precious memory in the history of our country. So you see them again focusing on sacrifice, focusing on common things. You see in Wheeler's speech, to some degree, war is a refining moment for these people, for these countries. And so you see these veterans drawing out the war. They're walking the battlefields to recall fallen comrades, death, the war's ultimate importance, articulating why it happened, why it's important. Value of the Union, emancipation, future progress, the virtues of a country lost. Um, you see them trying to answer the question, was the sacrifice, suffering, and heartache worth it? And interestingly, in 1900, for these people, the answer was a <coughs> resounding yes. They all agreed the war was worth it. Why? You remember David Cronin in 1865 saying, no civilized society could support this. What changes between then and 1900? You see Dan Sickles, a lifelong politician, sometimes soldier, keynote speaker, saying slavery would yield only to the sword. The perfect union of today was not to be reached without the sacrifice of blood. So to Dan Sickles, the war was necessary. Sickles details the progress of America after the war at length. And when I say that these speeches compose a book, I mean Dan Sickles wrote a really, really long speech. I won't subject you to all of it. But I will say that his conclusion was that the war made us better. And I will give some of his words to that effect. He said, the tempest, it is the tempest with all its terrors of lightning and thunder that purifies the air we breathe. Great geological convulsions upheave mountains, cut pathways for rivers, 
bring within our reach the treasures of the earth and give form and beauty to the landscape. And so it seems to be the ordinance of God that war opens the gateway to civilization, to the grandeur of nations, and to the emancipation of the oppressed. Later he adds, so it seems that in the order of providence, it is only through conflict that nations can reach the greatest heights of human power. So he sees war as this refining force that makes us better, that improves the country and improves the men who participate in it. It's a really incredible statement from somebody who lost his leg to the war. But the opinion is not universal. And so the then commanding general of the entire United States Army, Nelson A. Miles, a career military man, wounded at Chancellorsville, earned the Medal of Honor there, is also giving an address at the same time. And he argues, well, he agrees that the fallen did not die in vain, but he doesn't really seem to share Sickles' view of the war as a refining force. He said, we are united, and against the whole world we are one, and I trust that we are so walled in by two oceans that we cannot become involved in any serious controversy with any other nation on earth. Our mission henceforth is one of peace. We can conquer through the intelligence of peace, through the mission of peace, and we do not need to resort to the arbitrament of arms. It's a very interesting statement from someone who spent his entire career in the military, especially fighting Indian wars. But he does say, we can conquer through peace. So interesting that these two people would draw absolutely opposite conclusions about war in the decades to follow. So when we start to look back on why veterans visit the battlefields, you'll notice that a lot of it is about making meaning, whether personal meaning, national meaning, um, including the Confederate nationalism, um, even though the nation no longer exists. Um, but you also see them being struck by the immense loss as they're walking these battlefields, these scenes of death and destruction constantly with them. So they might take in that peace, but at the same time, they're going to be washed over with their memories. As time heals the land, though, you see time beginning to heal these veterans. The bitterness isn't there, or it isn't as much there by 1900, or even the late 1880s. You see them restoring themselves as time is restoring the landscape, and as the Union itself is beginning to heal up. You see them articulating some reasons of their visit and leaving a lot more questions, though, in their wake. You see them trying to make meaning of the war, trying to make sense of everything they've lost. So the simple answer to the question of why the veterans go back would be to say to remember, to seek some kind of understanding of what happened and why, and then to some degree to heal. The complex answer would be to make peace, to make political statements, to honor the fallen, to see where their lives were changed, to swap stories, um, in some cases to ask for the bloodstained floor boys of where you lie wounded, um, to say goodbye, to better understand loss and war, all of these things, what consumed these veterans as they visited. And so the last question that I'd have for you all to think about is when you walk a battlefield today, don't we make some of the same connections? How do we make the same connections and how do we make different connections in the years that have ensued? So with that, something for you all to think about, but thank you again so much for having me. Um, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to oblige, as long as we have time. The, um, the shop fellow that wrote poetry and so forth and mentioned that, I guess to paraphrase, the ghost of Stonewall Jackson said that Lee was not fighting for you, meaning the enslaved. Do you think that's an admission by the, a northerner that the war was not about slavery and about states' rights? That's a great question. So in case someone didn't, anyone didn't hear, the question is Morris Schaaf, who's writing about the flowers and also about the spirits haunting the battlefields. When he says, um, and correct me if I get this wrong, when he says that Jackson is confronting the spirit of slavery and saying, you aren't. Lee is Lee's, not. Right. Lee is not, not striking for you tomorrow. Lee, tomorrow Lee will strike, but not for you. Let me dig up that exact quote before I butcher it, because it is a good one. Um, and yeah, he says, essentially, it's more Shaft saying the war was not about slavery. Or at least by 1864, the war was not about slavery. Lee's attack tomorrow has nothing to do with you, spirit of slavery, so you just get on out of here. So the question is, is that an admission by a Union veteran or a former Union soldier that the war was not about slavery? 
And I think that's an excellent and really complicated question. So I'm glad that you asked. I think that for um, a lot of people, much like today, the answer is going to depend on the person. I think that Morris Schaaf was not part of a vast conspiracy in any form to cover up the causes of the war. Um, and I think that to him, he was trying to make that very statement. Um, perhaps to Morris Schaaf, the war wasn't about slavery. Um, perhaps to Schaaf, um, it was. But the idea of that faded through time. And the, what became more important was the idea of reconciliation and saying that might have been an issue then, but it isn't now. It all depends, and a lot of that is a question that we would need to be in the head of Morris Schaaf to be able to answer. Um, I would say that Schaaf probably was not intentionally misleading anybody as to his opinion in his book, so I would say he probably did believe that. Were there any major reunions at uh, Chancellorsville or possibly in the wilderness similar to what took place at Gettysburg between the, the former veterans? So, great question. Um, is there a, a com comparable, massive reunion yeah. of Union and Confederate yeah. veterans at uh, any of our four battlefields, much like they had at Gettysburg? And the answer is not nearly on that scale. So, not like a big national reunion um, where they're intentionally gathering veterans from both sides. Um, the closest to that is going to be the two examples that I gave um, the 1900 Society of, of the Army of the Potomac um, gathering together in the earlier reunion. Uh, as Stein is writing his book, uh, where they're gathering prominent Confederate, Confederates and local Confederates to participate in a union free union. Um, you don't really have a massive effort to gather both sides together in the Fredericksburg area, which would have been very interesting, right? Because the Gettysburg happens on northern soil. Would the dynamic have been different on southern soil? It's a great question. Yes? You know, uh, my wife. My wife's ancestors and I also were at bloody angle with Carter's artillery. And uh, I always wish that there was really a little bit more. I always felt like that's sort of the stepchild of the, uh, of the battlefields, you know, in Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville area. I wish there was a little bit more, you know, at that particular battlefield. I don't know if there's any plan to do anything more in the future there or... So specifically, you said it's Pennsylvania? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Unfortunately, for some reason in the development of our park, and I think it has a lot to do with the, oh, I'm sorry, the question was about more development of the battlefield of Spotsylvania. Um, and I think that unfortunately for us, when our, our park was formed, there was a great focus on Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. And I think a lot of that came um, basically because Fredericksburg was already a center of population and Chancellorsville was so close and so easily accessible by road. Um, and so that continued even through the 1960s, which was our park's last major period of development of park infrastructure. And so our plans for the future are all very much regulated by